How's everybody doing this morning? All right. Well, so let's uh, let's get to it. So let's um, let's take a minute to remind ourselves where we were last time. Um, so let me go back to um, uh, what we had last time, uh, which was Euler's method. So if we have a differential equation, uh, so that would be an equation uh, that involves y and y prime or something like that, um, then we can get a rough numerical solution uh, by means of picking an initial point. Um, so that would be this. And then basically generating new points by means of those two equations uh, there. So um, what we basically just do is the t or x or whatever the, the independent variable is, you just uh, increase by a constant step size of h, and the uh, dependent variable y or whatever, um, you use the old value plus uh, the change times the step size, and that generates your new y value. Okay. Um, so then we also looked at um, how to program that in Mathematica, which I'll open that up in just a second. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch over to Mathematica. Oops. Um, okay, so here we are in Mathematica, and uh, the way we programmed in Euler's method was we um, um, did this for loop, which basically uh, made a list of points, first coordinate being the t coordinate, second coordinate being the y coordinate, and then this formula uh, basically made the new first coordinate equal to the old first coordinate plus h. Okay, so that's uh, uh, the t plus h part. And then this part got the uh, y, uh, the old y value, which is this, plus h times the slope, which is that. Um, so the good thing is that basically this little chunk of code is going to be identical to um, uh, almost identical for every single um, Euler's method uh, um, every time we use Euler's method. What changes are er, is uh, what your initial point is, okay, uh, what your step size is, and then what y prime is equal to, and in this case the example differential equation we were working with was 2y. Um, for uh, that. Uh, so the other thing that would change then is basically just how far forward in time do you want to run um, the model and that depends on your step size. So here our step size was 0.1. We did uh, 200 iterations of that and so that meant that we computed this from basically from 0 all the way out to t equals 20, which isn't even on the graph here, so we really could have gotten away with just doing um, this, and that would have been sufficient, um, and yeah. Uh, and then we looked at the graph of this stuff. Um, basically, the, the uh, list of points, if we use a list line plot, then Mathematica is basically going to plot all of the points and then draw straight lines between them. And if all of those points are really close together, then those straight lines, uh, it makes it look like it's a curve. Um, and then our um, um, uh, solution is the, or sorry, the Euler's method solution, the approximate solution, is the red 
series of straight lines, but there's so many of them they look curvy. The green, um, the green uh, curve is the exact solution uh, that we know um, just because we know what the solution is. Um, okay, so let me go back to the iPad for a second. Oops. Um, so what we're going to do is start to look at other differential equations that uh, model other uh, situations besides the one that we looked at uh, so far. So the one that we've looked at so far was that one. Um, which was basically our equation for exponential growth, or if I'd made that uh, the two negative, it would have been exponential decay. Um, but we're going to look at a different differential equation, and this one's called a logistic uh, differential equation. And it looks at first almost just like the uh, exponential one that we had a minute ago, um, uh, except it tacks on a second term here. So we still have a constant k, we still have the y, but we're going to tack on this new term here. Uh, and I, I've used here capital L minus Y, so K and L are constants. Okay, um, for sake of example, um, let's just use Y prime equals 2Y, 1 minus Y. So we'll use 1 as our value for L and 2 as our value for Y. Um, okay. Now, the solution to this thing uh, is actually pretty hairy to go through and derive, um, and, uh, and I'll write that out in, in just a second. In fact, let me just uh, look it up real quick. Um, so, um, uh, the solution to it is... Um, Uh, and I'm just cheating to uh, to look this up. Um, so it is uh, well, actually, you know, forget it. I'll uh, we'll I'll put this give you guys the solutions in a bit. Um, so if we looked at this and we said, okay, what is the solution? Um, it's not obvious. Uh, what it's going to be. Now, if we kind of examine the behavior of it, uh, if y is small, 1 minus y is close to 1. So, um, y prime would be close to 2y times 1, which is 2y. Okay, so if y is small, this should look like exponential growth. If y is approaching 1, then uh, 1 minus y is going to be close to 0, so y prime should um, basically be small. And in fact, it would go to 0. If y prime is approaching 0, then the slope is approaching horizontal. So the solution should uh, level off, basically. Okay, so basically, uh, graphically, if we if we look at this, then what we're going to have is, at first, it's going to look exponential. And in the end, 
it's going to level off to a constant and it's going to kind of do this in between. Okay, so let's go back into Mathematica and um, uh, just one second, I'll uh, get Mathematica correct here. All right, so let's go back to Mathematica and um, let's look at uh, how we would solve this differential equation um, there. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy all of this stuff and I'm also going to copy the um, the plot command. All right, and then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to make, let's see, I also need to copy um, this. I'm not going to copy the other two because we don't have the exact solution um, yet. Okay, so the two things I'm going to change is First, this is my new differential equation. Um, the right-hand side of this, so actually let me put this line after that line, and then what I can do here is just say f of t y. Um, but since I've already used f before, I'm going to rename my function g. Oops. And since I've already used P, I'm going to make these guys called Q. Uh, I've already used data, okay? And uh, for this, I'm going to make my initial value 0.1 instead of 1. Um, and then uh, the other things I need to change would be instead of data, I'm using data 2 this time. And instead of F, I'm using G. Um, and I'll still use a step size of 1, um, and then we'll call this Q4 instead, and uh, we'll graph Q1 and Q4. Okay, so uh, basically just, uh, just changed everything to be the new differential equation that we're studying, and... Um, uh, and then change the variables so that I uh, wouldn't wouldn't be uh, um, overwriting all the stuff that we did before. Okay, so here's what. Uh, oops, we have a bit of a problem there, don't we? Um, oh, that's the problem. It's data two. Okay. Um, so the other thing I need to do here is. Um, uh, the graph looks a little funky because I've got the y values going 0 to 10 here, and really I only want this to go up to 1. And then um, here I'm using the wrong data. I needed to use data, um, data 2, not data 1. Okay, so here's the rough, uh, rough shape of the differential equation. So, or I mean the solution curves. Um, the growth starts out very slow, becomes sort of exponential, and then levels back off um, as, uh, as we get closer to y equals 1. Um, okay, so what um, this particular differential equation models relatively well is uh, population growth. So... Uh, imagine that you have a situation where, um, uh, let's say there's, you introduce, um, say, 10 lions or, you know, something into a, uh, uh, a wilderness area, and there are no other lions in that area, then, um, um, the lions are going to start, you know, mating, eating, etc. And um, uh, then the population would grow over time. And at first, if let's say that there are 10 lions 
and a hundred thousand uh, whatever it is lions eat um, cows or something then uh, the lions are going to basically go crazy eating and mating and uh, so their population is going to grow exponentially uh, however uh, as the population continues to grow eventually uh, there's going to be uh, more competition for the same amount of food and so the population growth should level off and it levels off in our case here to one which is called the carrying capacity all right so let me actually redo the graph and um, let me do the stream plot for two okay so uh, here we see the stream plot for what happens for the growth if you are below the carrying capacity so that's the bottom half of the graph then you grow up until you reach the carrying capacity and then you just stay there so basically your birth and death rate would be exactly equal and every uh, your population size would remain roughly constant um, but if you start out above the carrying capacity um, then uh, the the population level would decline until it hits the carrying capacity and then it would stay there um, from from then on uh, and then if we look back down here here's our solution where we started at point one we had sort of slow growth to start uh, it sort of was exponential looking to start and then at some point it started to level off um, and uh, in this particular case, it's not too hard to see that the level off point occurs sort of right halfway in between uh, at point five. Uh, and um, right, so we've got um, sort of initial exponential growth and then it starts to level off to, um, uh, to uh, uh, the constant value, in this case, the carrying capacity. Um, okay, so um, in addition to population growth, uh, this could um, this differential equation you can also use to model um, a um, uh, say the uh, the spread of a rumor. So uh, if uh, so, imagine that there's some big rumor like uh, Wabash is going to go co-ed. Okay, so yeah, president decided yesterday we're going to go co-ed. Um, well, initially, some number of people know that rumor, and they're going to start telling other people who have heard the rumor, or have not heard the rumor. Um, and so initially, since nobody's heard the rumor, everybody they tell is going to be a new person, and the growth of who knows this rumor will be sort of roughly exponential to begin with but eventually when you start to get close to the total number of people um, the uh, most people have already heard the rumor and so people that you run into you're uh, you can't tell them something new because they already know it and so eventually uh, or the rate at which the rumor is spreading will slow down uh, until the point where you basically get to where everybody has heard the rumor and the rumor here um, the carrying capacity in this case would just be the total number of people um, and um, so but the the equation or the differential equation that models that is the same one that models this population growth um, you could also use this and and this is perhaps not shocking where we're going to go with this uh, and and some other stuff uh, is to model infectious diseases so um, this could be um, the model for an infectious disease where um, say for example um, you get the disease but nobody dies from it um, and you just uh, are are looking at basically who do you have the disease or not um, now that's not a very um, robust model for diseases so we'll, we'll actually spice this up later um, 
and um, um, spice it up to uh, to be a bit more realistic to how diseases transmit. Um, although that will significantly complicate things. Um, okay, so what I wanted to do next was to show you guys how you can compute all of this stuff in Excel rather than in Mathematica. So um, it is possible to import and export data from Mathematica into Excel and vice versa, um, which uh, will, will prove useful later. But let's um, basically solve this differential equation um, from scratch um, in Excel. And I'm actually going to use um, Google Sheets. Um, so one second while I switch over the screen. Okay, so um, so I've got Google Sheets loaded, and um, first thing, let me blow up the font a bit um, so that it's um, nice and big and you guys can see it. Um, okay, so um, the way we're going to do this in Excel um, is we basically have to define um, our H value, and I'll make this... Um, oops, that's not what I meant to do. Uh, I meant to just shrink this cell. We'll make our H value like before 0.1. And then um, our initial value for T and Y was 0, 0,1. Um, now, for the T's, we want to increase the t's by the constant sep size of h. So what I would want to do is I would want to say equal to the previous cell, which is a3, plus the value of h, which is b1. Okay, and that makes the next value 0.1. Now, if I click, uh, so you see at the bottom right of the cell that I've got highlighted, there's a little box. If you click and hold on that little box and drag down, then um, Excel will copy the formula that you used here to the cells below. All right, but look what it does. The formula changed from A3 plus B1 to A4 plus B2. Now, A4 is correct, because that's the previous value. But B2 is not correct, because we want it to add this constant 0.1 every time. So what we have to do is if we modify the formula by putting dollar signs in front of the, uh, the B and the 1, and then click and drag, then what it does is anywhere there's a dollar sign, it does not update the value. And anywhere there is not a dollar sign, it does. So that's how you can get it to be, uh, to do a constant. Um, okay, and then we could click and drag and this would uh, compute more values. So let's, uh, let's say we'll go down to here just to, to get the point. Okay, so what we need to do next is um, the uh, y prime, or sorry, the y part. Uh, well, Euler's method is that the new y value is equal to the old y value plus h oops, times the function of the old y and t values. Okay, now in our case, the new formula, we were doing the differential equation, so let me just, oops, um, I'll fix that in a second. We were doing the differential equation y prime equals 2y times 1 minus y. Okay, so then here, 
we need to program in 2y times 1 minus y. And it'll, so it'll be 2 times y, which was b3, times 1 minus b3. Okay, and then, um, so does that make sense there? How we translated the differential equation from uh, here into our formula for how to update y, uh, the y values. Okay, so any any questions on that uh, that part? So uh, it is relatively impressive, guys. We actually have more people uh, in the stream than are in the class. Um, so we've got uh, Dr. Denari. E. Uh, shout out to Dr. Dunaway. Um, all right. So, um, okay. So I hope that makes sense then how we got this formula. And the other thing I should point out is um, in this particular case, the differential equation did not involve t in any way, and that's why in our formula here, uh, we never are using the a column, we're only using the b column because it only depends on uh, y, not on t. Okay, so now that I've got the formula program programmed in, all I've got to do is click and drag, and uh, then uh, it will spit out the numbers there. And um, then we could make a, uh, a graph of this thing. Um, so let's, um, let's select the cells and then uh, let's make a chart and um, it will, um, um, it is smart enough to know that I wanted to use uh, T for some stuff and Y for the others and then you can, um, you can um, uh, mess with uh, the way the thing looks or, you know, what kind of plot it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, so our suggested is just to do a line chart. That's basically what we did in Mathematica. And there we go. That looks like the solution curve that we had um, in Mathematica. The only real difference here is um, basically the scale. So, um, uh, X or Google Sheets has uh, just scaled it uh, to make our, our sorry our T values only go up to zero to two point whatever, uh, which is all that we had actually computed for it. And um, scoot this over a little bit. Um, and um, the Y values in this case, it sort of automatically picked zero to one, which is good because that that was sort of reasonable. Um, okay, so, uh, and we could, uh, we could certainly take this further, so if I select both of these cells and click and drag, then it will compute more of them, and um, then we'll, um, we'll uh, go from, let's see, it's A to B25, we want to go all the way to B52 this time. And so this would be, yeah, there we go. And um, so now we've just got our plot over a larger range of T, and that looks exactly like what we had in um, in the case uh, before. Sorry, guys, the audio just died for a second for some reason. Um, okay, so, um, sorry, where were we? Uh, so, the solution curve here looks basically exactly like what we had in Mathematica, um, but we could do this, uh, we could also do this in, in, in Google Sheets or Excel. Um, okay, so one thing I will do is I will share uh, this sheet uh, with you guys and um, 
um, put that on, put a link to it on Canvas, uh, so that you guys can uh, um, uh, look at it. Uh, yes, Cam, and uh, it's going to go actually a little further. So you guys, I'm going to have you guys do a project on infectious disease modeling, um, and so being able to use Excel or Mathematica um, to solve this thing. Uh, solve these things is going to be uh, really key. Um, in particular, and this we'll, we'll talk about next time, um, we're going to talk about systems of differential equations. So what happens if you have multiple differential equations that are related together? Um, and that uh, can be a little bit more complicated, um, but uh, it's actually, it won't be so bad. It'll basically just be, uh, you'll have to add a another column here for another variable um, but the basic idea of, of everything will be roughly the same um, okay so um, so let's let's go back to Mathematica for a second and let me um, let's uh, graph the exact solution to uh, this and then kind of compare our approximation with it um, so uh, I'm going to cheat and basically look up um, the um, uh, the solution to this thing. Um, so um, the solution. Um, let me just call this G, capital G, because um, I've got to call it something. Um, it turns out to be, um, so our initial value was 0.1 and then um, times 1, okay, which was our carrying capacity, and then the denominator is the 0.1, the initial amount, plus 1 minus 0.1 times e to the negative um, uh, k, which is 0.1 times t. Uh, and let's hope that I got everything correct there. Um, and then let me do um, all right, so let me plot that and make sure that it looks so correct. Um, I think I might be missing a term there. Um, so, yeah, okay, I think I'm missing a term here. So, um, let me, uh, let's see one second. Uh, what do I need to do here? Multiplied by K. second guys okay I think I just need to multiply by well K is 1 so that shouldn't actually matter um, what range did it plot this over um, I am missing something here um, because so if we overlay these things um, together um, this is way too small, so I'm missing, I've got, uh, something wrong here. Um, um, oh, I know what it is. I forgot the, uh, the, sorry, I have the wrong value of K. This was 2, not, um, there we go. That looks much more reasonable. Okay, so, um. I had uh, been stupid and put um, uh, put uh, point 0.1 there, which was our value of H, uh, but I wanted the value of K, which was uh, 2. And the, the reason that the exponent is negative here is basically to, uh, um, to make this level off, because it's basically this number here is going to be point 0.1 plus something, and... Uh, this will approach zero uh, as t gets big, and so 
we'll just end up with this term basically will disappear for large values of t and that will leave us with basically just 0 0.1 over 0 0.1 which is 1 and that makes sense that was our carrying capacity so okay so let me suppress that graph um, oops and let me also suppress um, this graph and uh, let me suppress the output there and so then we get um, our uh, green curve and our red curve there. And I'm not sure why the green curve sort of looks like it's stopping. Um, that sometimes is just um, a matter of the order that you put things in. Um, unless I've managed to mess something up else here. Let's look back at the graph of it. Um, oops, that's not the right one. I wanted to look back at this. Uh, okay, so I, I probably messed something else up here, but uh, point being, and I'll, I'll uh, double check that I uh, have the right formula up here. Um, the, uh, the basic, uh, the point I wanted to make basically is that the uh, the solution curve for the exact solution and the solution for the um, the Euler's method solution, which is approximate, are pretty dang close together. Um, now, one thing I should say about Euler's method is for relatively nice differential equations like this, it uh, it's pretty good. It can be a little error prone. Um, particularly if you run it for very, very long time scales. So, for example, um, let me go back to um, uh, Google Sheets for a second. Um, so, let's say that um, here I've computed this from t equals 0 to just shy of 5 in increments of 0.1. So, and, and it worked fine it was nice and accurate well let's say that I went out to like t equals something ridiculous like a million well then I would be computing uh, these values basically 10 million of them and if um, since each new value is dependent on the previous value what happens is that the error uh, any numerical error or approximation error gets sort of progressively magnified the further out um, in time you go. Now, for this differential equation, it doesn't really matter um, because we, we basically are just getting closer and closer to 1. Um, but some other differential equations uh, are much more sensitive to this problem. And so uh, for large values of t, you get just kind of like garbage answers. Um, because the the error, uh, the approximation error gets sort of bigger and bigger uh, over time, and eventually you're, you're, it, it just all goes to hell. Um, so the um, uh, but for reasonably short time scales uh, and for reasonably small values of h or, you know, not too big, not too small, but sort of in that just right category, then you get reasonable approximations to um, the solution and, um, and everything's kind of fine. Um, now, I should also mention um, that the H is really important. So let me change the H to say 1, for example. Okay, and this, this maybe illustrates what I was talking about a second ago. If I make the h equal to 1 instead of 0 0.1, then the Euler's method solution is that. It's that zigzag stuff. Um, and basically what happens is uh, at a point here, um, our slope... Uh, is so big that we get to the other side of the carrying capacity 
and then when you're above the carrying capacity, the, um, the differential equation says that your population should de decay. And so you do that, but you end up on the other side of the other side of the carrying capacity. And then you just do the zigzag pattern. And notice that the zigzags are approaching 1. Um, we can see the same thing if we go back to Mathematica for a second. So let's, uh, let's change our h here to be uh, 1 rather than 0.1. And we basically get the same, uh, the same sort of thing, this zigzaggy uh, business going on. Um, and, um, and again, I'm not sure why the graph is only starting here and not... Um, Let's look at that. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure why it's cutting off the graph um, here, and we're not seeing the entire thing. That um, that's kind of weird. Um, so um, sometimes, like I said, it's a matter of the order that you put things in. Um, no, that's not the problem. Um, Yeah, so, and see, now the green graph has just disappeared entirely, which makes no sense. Oh, that's because I typed Q1 twice. So, um, okay, well, so I'm a little perplexed as to the, why the graph is looking funny there, but essentially we're seeing the same behavior, uh, namely the... Um, um, the sort of zigzag pattern when you overshoot things. So this is why in practice uh, you want to use a relatively small step size um, to solve this thing and um, um, right. Uh, okay, so what, um, what we'll talk about um, next time or start talking about next time is what do you do if you have a system of these things? And in particular, we're going to look at a thing called SIR models. So uh, let me switch back over to Chrome for just a second. Um, and um, um, so you guys have probably seen um, uh, websites about um, uh, or things in the news about the the coronavirus situation so let's uh, let's take for example Indiana okay so we're here and um, the um, the graph here this red graph or this dark green graph is um, uh, basically the uh, projections for what would happen uh, for the coronavirus transmission if basically nobody did anything or if um, everybody stayed at home or if everybody stayed at home but really didn't do a very good job of it um, then uh, so we would get sort of these uh, curves of the total number of cases and the model that's being used to produce these is called the SIR model. And so let's go to the bastion of all knowledge of Western civilization and uh, look at uh, this. Then you probably would see, if you read you know, things about uh, the coronavirus, you're going to see graphs that look sort of like this. So the idea is that initially, you have a disease, and there's a small number of people that have it, um, but they're going to transmit it to other people. And initially, you have most people who have never encountered this disease, so they're susceptible. Um, and then uh, when people get the disease, there's some period of time after which they recover. Um, and so... Uh, this model here, basically the limiting um, for the particular constants that they used in, to make this particular um, 
uh, one, you start out with say 500 people and say one initially infected individual and it's going to transmit the disease uh, through these infected people and in this case uh, the total number of, of uh, cases uh, would be basically everybody eventually has the disease. So the red curve there is the infectious or people who currently have the disease. Uh, the yellow curve are the people that are susceptible and the blue curve is the people who have had the disease and then gone on to recover. And so at first you notice that the recovery curve lags behind the, uh, the disease curve and that makes sense because uh, in the case of the flu or coronavirus or any of these diseases, um, for a while when you have the disease, you are still sick and uh, it takes a while before you're, you're recovered. Uh, for COVID-19, right, this is like two weeks or something um, before your immune system is able to, to, to deal with it. Um, and so initially, the growth of the uh, the curve is sort of roughly exponential, but then it starts to level off. Okay, so the blue curve, uh, the the curve of the recovered individuals, excuse me, and the yellow curve, which is the curve of the susceptible individuals, both look kind of like our logistic uh, curve that we were looking at uh, earlier today, and then the red curve is uh, the number of people that are ill at any given point in time, um, and so you get sort of this bell-shaped curve that has a peak at some point and then starts to tail off basically as uh, the disease has run its course through the population and most people have had it. Um, so uh, we'll look at the, the mathematical details for this model and uh, then also how to adapt our Euler's method to solve it. Um, that part's actually not that hard. We essentially are just going to do more of the same. Um, but the details of the model are kind of interesting. And um, then where we're going to go with this is sort of a project on um, modeling uh, COVID-19 or, say, other diseases, um, historical diseases, and looking at what um, uh, what effects mitigation strategies have on it. So when people talk about flattening the curve, what they're talking about is that red curve there, that if you can make the red curve uh, spread out over time, then the height of that peak uh, you can keep smaller, and you can't prevent people from getting the disease. Um, I mean, we could, but basically that would mean doing what what China did or India has done and basically tell people do not leave your houses period end of statement um, and uh, if we did that then we could be through this whole thing in three weeks um, obviously though society can't function uh, if literally everybody just stays at home um, and so uh, various mitigation strategies are, are all about trying to flatten that red curve and sort of slow down uh, the rate at which the disease is transmitted uh, to the point where you can keep it, the red curve, basically below the capacity of your healthcare system to deal with people that are ill um, until you get to the point where there's, say, a vaccine or, or something like that. So, uh, okay, so we'll quit uh, for today, and uh, I'll post the links to... Um, the, I'll post the Mathematica file and the link to the Google uh, sheet on Canvas so that you guys can get a hold of it um, and use that. That way you basically don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you want to solve one of these things. And, uh, and I'll also post some exercises to go through and uh, uh, do a little bit of this sort of uh, computation stuff so you guys can uh, kind of get the hang of doing it um, before we get to the beefy project uh, level stuff. All right, so I'll go ahead and quit the quit the stream here, and um, um, we'll uh, we'll talk later. If you guys have questions, hit me up on Discord, and uh, I'll see you guys Wednesday, if not sooner.